In this episode we talk about Sci-Fi Max magazine, Brain Theory, our new story starting point feature, and a robotic Belgian crime-solving cat. Hello, I'm the voice of the Mariner 5 spacecraft, and you are listening to the Sci-Fi Ideas Podcast. This is the Sci-Fi Ideas Podcast, ideas and inspiration for science fiction writers. I'm Mark Ball, and this is David Ball. Hooray! Hooray. <laughs> Hooray, sorry, I thought you were going to say sorry. hello. Was that too enthusiastic? <laughs> it was just a little bit weird. <laughs> I'll I'll try and refrain from being too enthusiastic in the future. Um, so I normally start with a plug, uh, so I'll start with a plug again this time. A, a slightly self-interested plug. There is a new sci-fi magazine oh, just where, launched today. I wonder where you're going with this. I thought you started starting with an advert. Yeah. <laughs> well, an advert of sorts for Sci-Fi Max magazine, which I have two stories in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the self-interested it's... part. Yes. <laughs> no, it's a really good magazine. Though, well, I'm saying that I've not even read it, but I've, I've looked it's... at the front cover. <laughs> yes. It's only it's just launched um, today. Yeah. In fact, a, a few well, about an hour ago, I, I was told about it, uh, and it's looking great. Just kind of thumbing through and seeing all the goodness that's in it, including my stories and. Lots of, uh, well, a couple of comic books as well, or well, comic strips, rather, yeah, which that really are looking brilliant. Me. They're, they're really, really good. <clears throat> the this whole... whole magazine is looking amazing, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I, we were kind of talking just before we started recording, weren't we, about how this sort of magazine doesn't really make sense anymore because with the internet and things, uh, articles being able to res- uh, change responsively and, and, and things to, yeah. to the size of because your Because this is an online one. magazine, it's not a print magazine. But it's done like a print magazine. Yeah. Not an online one, so it's limited by, well, a, a lot of factors. But I actually think now it just looks really, really good. They've they've laid it out so, so well, you know, better than you probably could make a website look. So, yeah, so they, they've done I, it. and of course better than you would be able to in... A real print magazine without spending a lot on colour printing. Yeah, true. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. And, and the interface, uh, this is available through issue.com, uh, which is a magazine kind of aggregate um, and app. Yeah, and that's the interface I-S-S-S-W works W-S-S-W really well. dot com. Yes. Which I've never heard of, but it seems quite popular. Mm. Well, it seems to have a lot of content in there anyway. So let's hope this is going to be a hit magazine. Yeah, so this is the first issue. Yeah, this is issue zero. Yeah, okay. A beta issue. Uh, Peter Saga, that's running it, wanted to get an issue out before he started promoting it so that he's got something to show people. Um, yeah. So there is going to be a website dedicated to it eventually, and uh, who knows, it might be available in different formats as well. But for the moment, this is, this is the test, and the test yeah. is... Getting a big tick from me. Yeah, well, it's 80-something pages. 88 pages, which is is substantial, isn't it? Yeah, really good layout, really good artwork. Like you said, he's got some comics in there. He's got a lot of really cool sci-fi artwork, which is... uh, It's not difficult to come by, but it's difficult to, you know, find fresh and original sci-fi artwork. Yes, and and then to get permission to print it as well. Yeah, yeah. They've got a lot of really cool stuff in here. Uh, I've noticed they've got some things for role players as well. Some role playing resources, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So they've got stories. They've got comics. Uh, they've got just just full pages of art, and then they've also got right in the end they've got something about a location to to go to if you're running a role playing um, you know a tabletop role play, uh, mm. a shuttlecraft map, which I don't know you could use with a Warhammer type thing or just a map for the tabletop. Yeah, it's just there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I have the privilege of being the very first story after the contents page. Uh, that's my, that's, that's really an honour. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, alright, tell us about the story then. 
the story has been published on Sci-Fi Ideas before. It's called See You on Ravana. We've talked about it on the podcast, I think, twice. Have we? Oh, let's yes, not do it. So. <laughs> what's, what's the other story, then? Is, the, the second story? story is called Thorg and I. Very short piece, only a thousand words or, or less, um, which I wrote as a little bit of an experiment. Um, in fact, Steve Merrick on the Sci-Fi Writers Group uh, was talking about um, free writing. Yeah. Where you just sit down and you just start writing and see what, what happens. Um, and that's what I did, and that's how I came up with this story. At yeah, least okay. that's what I told myself I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's fine. Free writing, that's something that I've heard of through NaNoWriMo, where mm. you've got to you've got to hit a certain uh, target of not a... Uh, you know, word count, yeah. and they say just just write, just, just whatever. Write don't yeah. don't worry about it. Right, you can edit it later. Don't worry. Just you just have to yeah. get something out there, and you know, once you're writing, the ideas kind of come to you. Um, and if they don't, you can take that whole section out. But the the point is, you're you're doing something. You're putting it all down. Yes, and you know, it's you're, a very you're important there. exercise for writers. My teacher, my creative writing teacher at uni, he used to say that writers should write something every day. It doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter if the result is any good. It's just important to write something. It's like an athlete should go for a run every day. Yeah, yeah. It's just okay. about stretching your legs. Yeah. But I think as well it's a good excuse to kind of take some of the pressure off your back by right. saying this is just free writing. I'm not going to use this. You kind of take the pressure off and it allows oh, okay. you to just kind of to have fun with it. Yeah, so you don't um, have that pressure where you're thinking, oh, this has to be right first time. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And that's why I really enjoyed writing this Thorg and I story, and, and I think it's hopefully fun to read as well. Hmm. Um, oh, it is. I, think, I love it. I think it is something that I was, it's something that I was wanting to write anyway, but because I yeah. told myself it was free writing, it made it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you going to mention the, the other two? Because this is a part of a... Well, there's three three parts to this so far. I, I've there? written two more, yes, um, which I don't know what's happening with them. If they might be in this magazine, um, it might be something to serialise. I don't know. Um, basically, I, I enjoyed the characters of Thorg and I so yeah. much that I decided yeah. to to do some more, just play around with some more ideas. Um, yeah, it, kind it's of like... just brilliantly simple, which is why I liked it. You can instantly get the characters, and it just feels like there's a lot of characters, a lot of character there even though you don't really labour the point you know you, you don't go well Thorg is this and then you describe all about his, his, his race you don't explain about the character uh, hang on who is I? I have no idea who I is um, <laughs> I'm thinking that I is a human um, I'm starting to get some ideas about his, his character that I think he's a bit of an alcoholic um, oh. <laughs> possibly a bit of a rogue I think they are Han and Chewbacca yeah, it definitely seemed like that. But you could take... It doesn't have to be that. It's only me reading it, putting those personalities onto the characters that yeah. I'm reading about. They have a very similar kind of uh, relationship to Han and Chewbacca. They, they yeah. roam the galaxy looking for opportunities, basically, yeah. and they don't always get on, but they have a close working relationship. And, and yeah. Thorg is a big monster. Right, um, say no more, because yes. uh, I think if you, if you describe it too much, it takes away from the story, I reckon. Yes, yes. Because uh, the story is just very... It's short. just very easy to read. It's very short, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think everything is, is explained in the story, so... Yeah. What okay, else so, so get your hands, readers, uh, listeners, get your hands on this magazine. Um, Sci-Fi Max, available from issue.com. Um, and read my stories in there. <laughs> yep. And all the others, of course, in the comics. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the comics do look really, really cool. Okay, so the last... Ooh, can't think of what to say. <laughs> so last time... Let me... I've I've been drinking some uh, Krabbies and... Uh, I feel a little bit lightheaded. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to struggle to put sentences together. So last time we did a podcast, uh, we've published quite a few things on the on the site. So you've had, well, you've been busy. You've written loads of stuff. I, so I've been busy with the starting point feature. That's, that's given indeed. us 
quite a lot of um, well of, of articles and comments. Um, this is the feature where I post the start of a story, or, or rather a snippet of a story, it's, it's not necessarily always the start, um, and ask you how would you continue it. Um, and yeah. we've had a good response. We've had some people actually commenting with uh, the rest of the story uh, from their viewpoint. Yeah, and that's uh, really cool. So That's the, really interesting. Yeah, it is. So the first one you did was the starting point, Crystal Gods, mm. which was a story about, well, about this... Well, you explain it. There's a kind of a... It's quite image-heavy. Each mm. one has a, has a really good picture with it. And I start with the picture and then just kind of... Well, this is it's got a big glowing crystal and some people around it. And so I've got that these people are examining it and saying about the villagers, whoever the villagers are, call this thing a god. Um, I probably should have just read it out, shouldn't I? <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking that. It'd be sure to just read out the, the, the starting <laughs> Do well, you want to do it or, or shall I? No, if you want. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Javin approached the crystalline plant structure with curious eyes. It was old, centuries old, and it had grown to enormous proportions. Little wonder the villagers revered it so deeply. It must have been here for countless generations, and the way it glowed was... Javin wanted to think of it as magical. He tried to see through the villagers' eyes. He really did. But to him, it was actually kind of eerie. At the base of the crystal, the villagers had carved a series of shallow stone steps and a deep fissure cut right into its glowing heart. This must be what the villagers called the altar. Javin could believe that their offerings affected the crystal in some way, or rather the life forms living inside it. Perhaps it, or they, could even be reliant on them in some way. But the miraculous powers Yin Hal had described, no, that was impossible. Hey, Javin, come have a look at this. And that's it. That's the well end. done. So that's, Thank that's you. the end story. I, I hate reading aloud. <laughs> <laughs> I did it without... Did I manage no to no that mistakes there. Yeah. That's, that's oh, yeah. pretty good for a first take. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what doesn't come across uh, spoken is the altar. I actually misspelled it. I spelled oh. it altar as in change. Now, that was a typo. Oh. Um, that was pointed out in the comments. Um, people asked, was, was that a mistake or was it intentional? That was a mistake. But hey, it's an interesting mistake because that then led people to think, okay, so does this alter people in some way? Ah. Or, or does the crystal alter? Um, so we have some interesting takes on, on how that story would continue. Um, what is okay. this crystal? Um, people have different ideas. It's interesting. So we've had some good comments on there by Christmas Snow, which is, uh, that can't be someone's real name, uh, Ryan mm. Holloway, <laughs> and John uh, Charles Scott. Mm. Okay, do you want to move on to one of the other um, story starters that you've done? Yeah. <clears throat> so this second one, I think it's the second one, is the uh, A Snail's Pace. Aha, yes. Brilliant picture here of, of a man riding a giant snail that appears to have some kind of engine on the back. It's like a steampunk type of contraption thing, yes. isn't it? Would you call that steampunk or would you say diesel punk? Ooh, possibly diesel punk. <laughs> <laughs> like it matters. Like it matters. <laughs> what none of us can figure out here is why does the snail have an engine? <clears throat> well, it doesn't matter. Well, the snail it... can't be powered by the engine, so maybe it's some kind of onboard computer. Okay, right. So this is um, artwork by Ricardo Juarez. Um, if you want to see his deviant art page, probably have link, the article, yes. links to it. Um, so do you want to read this out as well? Um, I, I think we should skip because what? Uh, we can't do everyone. Uh, well, you haven't done that. Well, you oh, got, all right. Skip this one. Right. Yeah. If you if you want to read it, have a look uh, on sci-fiers dot com. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, basically, um, these are just ideas to help you get writing, and maybe for a free writing exercise, just. Uh, Something to get you going. Yeah, of course. Um, um, there's another... there, there was a, the other one, starting point, Fox 1, which we'll skip, because basically that was about a giant octopus. No more information is required. <laughs> no, true, yeah. It's a giant octopus on a on a landscape, and then the, the picture has a, like a, a jet plane flying towards it. The, the, that, that was just an opening for people to share lots of octopus-related jokes, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> 
how do we kill this thing? Somebody suggested salt bombs. <laughs> Someone su- suggested a giant robot sushi chef. <laughs> <laughs> That's just that's Japanese thinking, that isn't it? <laughs> that's Pacific Ring thinking. <laughs> uh, you've also got uh, you've posted an inspiration gallery with the art of Frankar Paul, who mm. I, don't, I don't know who he is. His artwork is amazing. He's he's a veteran illustrator. He's illustrated um, all the the great Golden Age magazines, um, like yeah. uh, Fantastic and Astounding and and such. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so some ideas there of, of what aliens might look like on the planets of the solar system. This you know was what, this done is... back in the, what, 60s when we didn't know it anything like about it, the other planets. So. And that is absolutely, these are amazing because if you think of an alien now, you think of grey, big eyes. You know, we've seen aliens mm. before in films and they've all kind of been, you know, you get the creative ones, but you also get the the staple alien. Whereas these are uh, created from no context. You know, there's no context at all here. And so you've yeah. got the first one. The only context is what little we knew about these planets back then, which was very, yeah. very little. Um, for instance, Venus is, is thought to be a tropical world back then. Right. Which used to be what people thought. Uh, we know different now, but this is still quite useful because you might think, okay, I'm creating another planet and it's tropical. And, and so you could actually use aliens like this. But the, the the alien here, he's kind of he's got gills. He's got, uh, it's like a flying squirrel. He's got a, like bat's underarm wing thing. But he's got webbed feet, and he looks like he's all scaly. And then he's got large eyes, like a like a tortoise. It's just, yes, it's I, I think they're amphibious, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's what it looks like. Then the the one that's called Life on Mercury. You've got this creature that looks like, I don't know. He's he's got this like insect like legs and arms but then he's got a face like a lizard and then ears like a bat i think they're just insane with the creativity that they've got on them i just i love stuff like this that's brilliant isn't it now that the interesting thing thought that occurred to me when i was looking at them is some of these aliens have technology some of them look quite advanced um the mm. man from uranus is coming out of a, a bit of a hole. Uranus, <laughs> sorry. He's coming out of some kind of sphincter in the Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's um, in, in, in an environment suit. Man. Okay, so I'm yeah. thinking, what if these people are capable of going into space like we are? So what if that they all start fighting? I think it's, it's interesting, the, the interactions that they could have with each other. Hmm. Like the Uranians could start invading other planets yeah. and would we have to then go to war with the uranians to protect the weird insect people of saturn oh i see so there's politics there yeah so we have to pick a side yeah we get we might get brought into the war yeah just if, if every planet in the solar system was inhabited perhaps. that would be crazy it would be crazy actually anyway let's move on from that because it's an image based one. Yeah, it is. For the um, so <laughs> we've got another thing. Uh, do you want to talk about the the, the sexy sofont species from Daniel Daniel N Benson's New Frontiers? Story? Oh, if you like, you uh, you handled this article, didn't you? You were talking to to Daniel. Yeah, well, he wrote he wrote it. Um, so New Frontiers is a, a novel by Daniel N Benson, and so what he's done is he's thought about these aliens from the reproductive system up with nods to some of the odder sex lives of real-life organisms. Now, this, it's a bit of a weird one, and I I kind of feel a little bit nervous explaining it, because as soon as you say aliens and sex lives and reproductive systems, (laughs) people immediately assume that you mean, like, tentacle porn, that sort of thing. Now, this is nothing like that at all. This is, it's very sensible, it's um, it's well thought out and, and... he he's obviously doing something that's very different, because um, he's talking about the the way that aliens reproduce and the whole story. Uh, and not... this then it affects the way that the aliens interact. It affects their society, doesn't it? Yeah, of course, and it affects the way that you know in human society, it affects the way that we interact with each other. Uh, yeah, exactly. Of, of course, it does. So it's not about the pumpy pumpy. <laughs> <laughs> 
and and, and uh, because of this article that um, we put on Sci-Fi Ideas, there was a discussion going on in the um, Sci-Fi Writers Group on Facebook. Someone was saying, "Well, why why show the sex lives of aliens then, if if only for titillation?" And yeah, then well, someone uh, says, "Well, well of course, you need to show other things. You need to show maybe to to." invoke jealousy in other characters yeah or, or just to show how different aliens are to to humans i think for world building this is a great place to start if you're creating an alien species how they reproduce is, is like <clears throat> the perfect starting point to then start building on top of that the different hmm. layers of their society yeah yeah this is how they interact with each other on a basic natural level yeah, of course. So then you start adding the social rules, and then you start adding the uh, advancements of society, and yeah, that's how you create something interesting and different. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I'm I'm convinced that that's what he's done here. He's he's created mm. something very different, which it, it's not rare that someone creates something, you know, really different and interesting. But it feels it. You know, when's mm, the last time that you does. saw say, say if you're watching a a, a sci-fi film like a Hollywood film. Uh, well, let's not that's... fall into this trap, though. TV that... has very, very dull aliens because well, they're very difficult to create on screen. But well, sci-fi literature has a lot of really interesting aliens like true. this. True, it does. I yeah. think what's interesting here, though, is, is getting a glimpse inside Dan's mind as he's creating these, of uh, kind of his thought process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there is a link to that article in the show notes. We all know interspecies romance is weird, but I like weird, and so does my sexy alien wife. Uh, do you want to talk about the Big Bang and Brain Theory, which was done by Stephen Lyle Jordan for us? Yes, we can. Um... Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit complicated this one because this is about the. Um... Oh, about the... The, the news the... Uh, this week, or, or last week, was it now, about uh, this proof of inflation theory uh, with the start of the universe, which, yes, it is very complicated. And you're probably <laughs> yeah, better off listening to science. a proper science blog about this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about that they can prove the Big Bang that happened and things. And so uh, Stephen Lyle Jordan starts talking about how... Well, what he's talking about here, really, is brain theory, which is so is it's... different to inflation theory. Yeah, okay, it is. But there's so there's these different layers of of uh, universes, aren't they? So yeah. He's talking kind of about he's, he's kind of uh, well, they're not dimensions, are they? Are they the actual different universes? Right. Okay. That uh, the, the existing t- parallel. Existing parallel, and they they have a certain frequency. Um, yeah. They kind of oscillate in some kind of weird extra-dimensional way that's impossible for us to imagine. Um, mm-hmm. And occasionally those frequencies will start to align, and right. it's the equivalent of of these universes touching each other. And when that happens, that's when the Big Bang happens, and a new universe is created between mm-hmm. them. Okay, so there's a few story ideas that come from this, mostly... Yeah, what um, I love about this article is how he's not getting bogged down in the science, he's going straight to how is this useful to us as writers. Yeah. So there's inspirational things there for for writers to take this and, and use it and use it as a you know plot point and things. Mm. So he says, imagine a race of powerful aliens that attempted to transition from their brain about to be destroy- destroyed to the brain about to be created. There might be life in the universe that's actually survived the Big Bang in this way, or is working right now to survive the end of our universe in another Mm. brain merging in our far future. Or possibly the aliens knew they could not survive, but they could do something that would somehow influence the new universe when created, maybe to improve the chances for life to arise on more planets, or cruelly to hinder the chances for life to develop. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. You know what it reminds me of? You know what it reminds me of? The... Asimov story, The Last Question. Have you read okay. that? Okay, I don't think I have, no. Oh, it's brilliant, and it's quite short, and um, I won't kind of paraphrase it here now, because it's it's really good, and it's got a brilliant ending. So, go and find it. Um, I'm sure you can get it on some website somewhere. 
So I think I saw it the, the, the other week. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Okay, yeah, great. Um, now, these ideas would also work with the, the big crunch theory as well, wouldn't they? Where the universe expands, then contracts, and then there's another big bang from that. Mm. But as little as I understand about this new proof of inflation theory, I do know this. It disproves big crunch theory. What? Yeah. So don't go using the big crunch. Well, you can use a big crunch use if you want instead. to. You, you, Although I think brain the theory might be disproved. Own... I don't know. Yeah, but you're the yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of, of course. Science well, fiction story. I, I would advise against it crunch. since this new evidence disproves the big crunch. Apparently. Ah, right. Okay. Just, just an FYI. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> now. We're on to the article that I've been looking forward to, because I want okay. you to read this out. This is the starting point that I just posted today. Robo Kitty <laughs> Don't versus say the today. ghost from the deep. Don't say today, because you were gonna, you're going to publish this in like a week's time. It's going to take uh, a week yeah, to okay. edit all this nonsense. At the point of recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the ghost from the deep. So how did the idea? Of this, how did this ridiculous idea come about? I can't remember how did this come about we, because this is a picture by you, based on some joke that we were having in a Facebook conversation. Um, I think we were. We were just talking about ridiculous titles of stories. So we came up with Robo Kitty versus. Oh, it Ghost was because of my my title generator at obscurehub.com. dot com. Oh, okay. silly titles. Yeah, it sounds like one of the. Weird things, yeah, because you had things like Margaret Thatcher versus the Nazis from Hell or something. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've done that in a previous podcast. If you haven't listened to it, go back and, and listen to us. Oh, can about we that. can we just can we just read out some more? Can we just oh. randomly generate some more because they are funny? Go on then. <laughs> right, you go find some while I read out this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, th- th- this is, you decided to create this picture based on this joke, and then I've turned it into a story starting point, and we want you to finish the story. It is the worst picture that I think I've ever made in Photoshop. <laughs> of of ro- <laughs> this this cat on a robotic body. Um, okay, when you read this out, Dave, Robo Kitty has a French accent. Remember that. Oh, what? <laughs> a Belgian accent. I want him to sound like Poirot. <laughs> Belgium, Belgium's not in France. No, but they speak French. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Robo Kitty peered into the tank and examined the remains in close detail. The water had been strained. Uh, s- sorry, the <laughs> the water had been stained red with human blood, but his ocular implants were able to see through the haze and allowed him to examine the body on a microscopic level. There was very little left of the diver, only a few chunks of gnarled meat, but amid the torn flesh, Robo Kitty could distinguish clear tooth marks. He ran the bite pattern through an analysis program installed in his cyber chair's memory banks. He'd added an animal bite recognition patch only that morning. He'd had a feeling it would come in handy on this trip. There can be no mistake, <laughs> Robo Kitty announced after only a few seconds of consideration. This man was killed by a shark. A shark? There was a gasp from the group, and Mr. Reynard scoffed at his guest's conclusions. Don't be absurd, Detective Robo Kitty. A shark couldn't possibly have gotten in and out of that shark tank without anybody knowing. Indeed, you are right, Monsieur. Robo Kitty spun his chair round in a dramatic fashion to face Reynard. Which leaves us with only two possibilities. That the shark had an accomplice... Or that we are, in fact, dealing with a ghost shark. <laughs> That's it. Now, well if you wanted me to read, if that you wanted me accent. to read that in a French accent, it's not, it's not written in like a phonetic French accent, though. No. And also, true. where did you get that the French? There's enough in there already. Robo Kitty. Play on the fact that he's a <laughs> robot. Know, he's a not robot, the fact robot that he's cat. French. He's so now we've got extra things like he's he's a detective, so it should be. <laughs> French detective, sorry, a Belgian detective Robo Kitty versus the ghost from the deep. <laughs> Where's the ghost from the deep from? He could be Australian. <laughs> <laughs> the Australian ghost shark. Brilliant. <laughs> Is the shark also a cyborg? <gasps> well, he might be. Cyborg ghost. Yeah. Can you get cyborg ghosts? Um, in Magnus Robot Fighter, yeah. 
Oh yeah, you can. <laughs> you can. <laughs> right, has anybody come? Nobody's commented. It's rubbish. Oh dear. Mind, mind you, you have only put it on today, so. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, have fun with that one, people. See if you can make sense of that. I want a full, uh, full novel written about that. <laughs> have you found us any uh, any interesting story uh, titles? Sci-fi title generator. I've got it up now. Um, Bortak and the Crack in Space. <laughs> Joe Stalin versus the Clockwork Knight. <laughs> oh, the Clockwork Knight. That sounds good. Hitler versus the Super Giraffe. <laughs> Pulsar number five, imagine. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my tentacles is missing. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good. I can I can see that being a uh, you know like a, a comedy film. short. Yeah, yeah. Johnny T Rex meets the Emperor of Space. <laughs> Johnny T Rex is that a, is that a man or an actual T Rex? Both. <laughs> it's like a werewolf. Sometimes he, or maybe if he gets angry, he turns into a T Rex. Yeah. Oh, that would be a comic, right? Someone make that into a comic. <laughs> Never wing cataphylaxian. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds like it's, it's, it's one one tip from like a book of um, a book of galactic tips. Never wing at a what was he called? A Galaxian? A Flaxian. A Flaxian. Ah. That's, that's page two of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. One, don't panic. Two, never wink at Flaxian. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Ah, oh, you want more? No, no, no. Let's move on. Invasion of the Megafish? <laughs> Megafish. Let's move on. The Challenger <laughs> Rift. That sounds too it's serious. In the space shuttle. Yeah. Oh, the, the challenge well, is in the, oh, the Challenger rift. What the uh, the Challenger spacecraft went through an interdimensional rift, sparking some kind of lost like story. Ooh, that would be good. Maybe it came back to Earth, and uh, an Earth's different. There's a different mm. Earth through the rift. Yeah. I think just little things are different. Imagine that if you come back from space, and everything's yeah. the oh, same. Oh, that's kind of an overdone trope, apart though, isn't it? from. One little thing is different. Is that an overdone trope, really? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Well, we had a whole show dedicated to it. Sliders. Oh, true. It was rubbish. It's kind of, <laughs> you love sliders. Don't say I do rubbish. love sliders. <laughs> the first two series were amazing, and then it went downhill. Yeah, it got silly in the tape. So let the people smile. How can I be a virgin eye? Right. This has been the Sci-Fi Ideas Podcast. I've been Mark Ball, and this has been David Ball. No, I'm not saying hello. Oh, <laughs> say goodbye. <laughs> I'm saying goodbye. Oh, Please sorry. visit the Sci-Fi Ideas website if you're not already there. Uh, sci-fiideas.com and subscribe. Also, check out Sci-Fi, uh, Sci-Fi Max magazine, the brand new magazine with some of my stories in. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes along with all the other articles we've been talking about in the podcast. And send us a message on Facebook or Twitter, whichever you prefer. Mm -hmm. Um, Give us some ideas for for the next uh, podcast as well, for things to talk about. That'd be quite good. Yes. Okay. Bye. I'm the voice of the Mariner 5 spacecraft. You have been listening to the Sci-Fi Ideas Podcast, and I've been drifting deeper into the infinite void of space. Goodbye.